Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly, all streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. And by squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off your new account for six months, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code FRAMERATE7. It's frame rate. With your hosts, Brian Brushwood. And Tom Merritt. How are you doing, Tom? I am doing well. How are you, man? I'm doing uh, super good. Super awesomely good. By the way, that opening scene, that was Matt Mulholland on YouTube. The Matrix lobby scene with Acapella multi-track. In fact, I'm going to tweet it right now. That's how much bang, I like bang, it. Bang, so if, you, bang, 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 if you're following bang, bang, me on the Twitters, then you could get it. That's at Schwood. Oh, That's Twitter. Good. I used to use that before Google+. Plus. I remember that. Oh, man. It's, uh, have, you, have you banded one for the other? Yeah, well, you know, I like Twitter back in the old days with the original lineup of Ev and Biz, you know, when they were rocking it hard before they sold out to the man. No, I don't Is that what you're saying? They're, they're the Black Sabbath of yeah. uh, social media. They're now? REO Speedwagon in the 80s. This is their <laughs> can't fight this feel. No, I'm not saying that at all. It's just, it's just all in good fun, you guys. Dick Costello, I'm kidding. I love like, the Twitters. Are you, are you see, that is that's called uh, that's called defensive posturing. The moment you say that, you're like, please, guys, don't don't call me out on your shows. Don't don't <laughs> regret having said this. Exactly. Uh, well, it's it's a, uh, a fantastic frame rate we have in store for you today, ladies and gentlemen. And we're going. Yeah, we're to talking s- like 50, 60 frames per second. I mean, easily, easily. We're, we're maybe four K. Just saying. We're talking in Retina Display, mm-hmm. 60 FPS, awesome. Red camera, awesome. Starting with this big story. This just in, the big story. The BBC is deciding whether they should ban talent on their television shows from using Twitter so that plot devices don't get leaked out. Um, Other pu- public forums, too, but Twitter is mentioned particularly in uh, uh, the Guardian story. The Guardian cites senior sources uh, at BBC saying the execs are mulling over the possibility of tweaking contracts to stop talent from blurting out storyline spoilers, casting news, and planned press announcements. Now, this would not ban them from using Twitter altogether. It would just say, we want to put it in your contract that you can't scoop us. Well, okay, now that's one thing. That's one thing. But it says, it says the headline, of course, says ban them from using Twitter, right? Uh, that's the headline on the register, but that's not actually what the Guardian story says. Uh, this all goes back to singer Sophie Ellis Bextor, who recently put on Twitter that she would appear alongside Sting in a new BBC comedy series uh, fronted by Ricky Gervais and Stephen Merchant from The Office fame. So a show's called Life's Too Short. Now, the BBC had planned to make a big deal about Sting's appearance on the show. Right. And so the fact that she posted it on Twitter kind of took the wind out of their sails. 
Uh, you know, I don't know. T uh, Twitter's a two-way street, man. It's like if you want the benefit of having somebody tweet something and it feeling like a leak, then you probably ought to allow people to leak things if you want the benefit of, of that vibe. Well, I think what uh, they're talking about is putting it in the contract saying, look, we have guidelines in place. We're going to make those guidelines enforceable by your contract. In other words, we're going a step up from saying, gosh, we really wish you hadn't done that. It's against the guidelines to, gosh, we're not going to pay you now because you violated your contract. Uh, you know what? I always thought it was that way. This is the first time hearing that in my imagination. Well, with the BBC, it wasn't, apparently. But but surely other other institutions, other filmmakers, other you know TV studios, they 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 have to have something like this. I would think there might be ways in which it is written that involve talking to the press, and because of self-publishing being so new in this manner, self-broadcasting being so new so, in this manner, so, that the, so the contracts new. may it's not cover Twitter. A tender 18 years old since you were able to publish your opinions on a website, and finally, we're well, coming yeah, but, around. But most, most celebrities have not started publishing their own websites, or if they did, they hired somebody to do it. Twitter came along and made it dead simple, where there was no... I mean, we had a whole series on Tech TV on the screen savers where we would send roger chang to people's houses and set up their websites and their technology for them you know, for celebrities and stuff so this is you know twitter made it so that anybody with a phone could publish now it's a problem yeah well i'll tell you what i understand the nature of the attention grabbing headline but uh, here's the exact statement from the bbc quote the bbc is not banning the use of twitter by talent or writers the bbc has clear guidelines in place both for the personal and professional use of social media, and we encourage staff, writers, and talent to use social media, provided it does not break any confidentiality agreements. This, uh, this sounds legitimate to me, and and um, I, I think it's good, but it does open up the more interesting question of how much is too much? What? Uh, obviously, I'm comfortable with this. I assume you are as well, right? Yeah, it seems like I, I find what I find interesting is not the fact that the BBC wants to stop people from spoiling stuff, right? I, I, I find that perfectly understandable. There may be times when trying to fake a big surprise isn't a good idea. Like maybe the sting appearance, it's like, you know what, you may, you may actually be undermining yourself by saving it up. You don't know. There's always that law of unintended consequences, but there are definitely times that where in a plot point, for instance, like a major character dies, you don't want that getting out. It ruins it for everybody. So you, you know should what? have the ability to decide as the producer what gets said and what doesn't. It's just interesting to me that they're having to take into account social media now that it's pervasive. So uh, I'm going to make a prediction here. I'm going to say that uh, pretty much they should treat this almost like an antivirus campaign and figure out ways if what they want to do is really protect major plot devices and plot points. I predict at some point a major news story will be that the way they protect certain spoilers is by a massive campaign of disinformation from allegedly – legitimate sources like for example they say okay you say this character died you guys tweet out that this character has a baby you guys claim that it turns out that you know they're brothers and you guys claim this like i i, I could totally see an orchestra orchestrated campaign like that in order to get everybody definitely definitely confused as to what actually is going to happen because there's two ways to win you can win by keeping everything locked tight or you can win by uh, by again disinformation yeah I, th I think you're probably right and i think it's a combination i think they're going to tighten up their contracts and say look these confidentially uh, confidentiality agreements specifically state that you won't go on twitter or facebook or any other similar site and make the spoilers because you don't want somebody going oh i didn't understand right i think that's probably what's going on here and then i think that i think that's a great idea is to you go out with a massive disinformation campaign to be like no actually i heard it was somebody else totally you know and you could even enlist your stars in the disinformation campaign. If well, and I'm sure they would well. love that. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, I don't know if they'll get all up, but he'd be like, well, I don't lie to my fans or whatever. Well, some of them will, and that's fine. Yeah, well, but, but again, if you, I think if you frame it as a game, I think it would be pretty good. But we've already seen stuff like this yeah. before. For example, during the shooting of Empire Strikes Back, on set, uh, you know, Luke Skywalker, uh, Mark Hamill, as he's commonly known here on Earth, uh, was was aware of the the major plot twist at the end. Spoiler alert: nothing. Uh, turns out Darth Vader's his dad. And uh, wait a minute! Whoa! 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 <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, but they actually had David. Uh, was it David Prowse inside the costume for Darth Vader? They had him say, uh, "No, Obi Wan was your father." Uh, right? Just to just kind of shake it up. So if people right, exactly. Yeah. Just just to reduce, you know. So if something did get out, although all well, they did that with Lost too. There was a key scene where they open this coffin and reveal who's in the coffin, right? And then all of a sudden, you know, one of the characters that you didn't think was dead is now dead. They actually right. shot it with several mm -hmm. different characters so that no one on set knew which one ex was going into the final edit. That's so awesome. Now, what do you think they say to them? Do you think they, they further the lie by saying, oh, no, 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 there's going to be a bunch of dream sequences. So, uh, Well, I, I know from, the, from Lost, they told them, one of you is, this, this is going to be one of you, but we're not telling you which one yet. Oh, so even the actors didn't yeah, know? Yeah, the actors didn't know either. Effect, do you think that affected how they played being dead? Well, you know, I heard that if, like, you re, if you listen to some of those interviews with the lost actors, they co they don't complain because they're being good employees, but they do seem like, they're like, yeah, I, I just kind of have to make stuff up because I really don't know where my character is going. They, they, they only tell us what we're actually shooting. They don't give us a lot of insight into where it's going because they don't want spoilers. I'm sure they took solace in knowing that the writers didn't really know either. By the way, hey, did, oh. now, and, and I mean that almost sincerely because did you ever listen to the commentary tracks that they put up for Battlestar Galactica? Uh, no, I've heard they're amazing though. They are amazing. It is. It was the day after Battlestar came out. Every time like clockwork, there'd be a podcast and it would be a, what Ronald D. Moore was his name, right? Yeah. And you'd hear his, uh, his, his whiskey clinking in his glass as he sat there and drank and watched the episode. And it was awesome because you got sincere commentary on everything. At some point, they said, you know what we ought to release is audio from one of our writers' meetings. And I would say it's sincerely a case of having pulled back the, the, the curtain too far. Because when I heard them saying like, no, wait, maybe it's this. No, maybe it's that. You're like, no, wait, I well, know. And, and Battlestar didn't have a plan. Lost always claimed to have a plan, and I think they did. They just didn't have a plan for all the things people wanted them to have a plan for. Whereas Battlestar, they, they freely admitted, like, we, we didn't know where we were going from the beginning. Well, and, and plus, also, that's the problem when every single intro to every single episode says, there are Cylons that killed humans, and they, and have, they have a plan. Well, <laughs> they we'll did, there. Brian. And they were you don't even know what it is. The humans didn't have a plan. <laughs> That's Our human writers do not, but the Cylons do. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think there's. I, it's really interesting uh, nowadays that the, the whole barrier to entry as far as knowing how the sausage is made, you know, there's, there's always been this rich history of making of films, and it's up to you. Like, do you really want to know how the movie magic's made? And there are some people who love that. But now we're at the point where it's like, do you want to know everything right as it's happening and as it's developing or do you just want to see the final product unveiled i wonder if there's going to be a way for more people to elect to say i guess the way you elect for it is just to not care to not read stuff because i remember for example with inception i remember accidentally accidentally uh, finding out what was happening in Inception before you saw the movie, you stumbled across something like that. I'm, I'm restating uh, what you were about to say because I'm hoping that your connection will, will come back. And, and there it does. Stupid connection. Yes, thank you. That is, uh, no, I, I showed the trailer and he didn't even know he was looking at the Inception trailer because he had so carefully avoided anything spoilerish for so long. And then he realized what he was watching and he was like, no, no, covering his eyes. Uh, okay, uh, well, Pig lips. That's how the sausage is made. Let's move on to another big story. <laughs> Stop everything. It's another big story. Hey, remember previously on Frame Rate when Brian and I had that big argument about Movie Pass? Turns out that was that was moot. I I feel so bad because when I went to go handle the feedback segment fully half the letters were people chiming in on that debate and since it's not even a debate anymore i just had to reply thanks for your input <laughs> yeah so it turns out movie pass announced its launch last week uh without having talked to the theaters <laughs> now that's not quite as stupid as it sounds although it's it's pretty close they talked to the online ticket sailors sellers so they talked to the fandangos and they got them all on board sure so you would think well if fandangos in on it and they're willing to you know handle it then i guess the theaters will just have to go along uh but the theaters all said oh no we're the ticket takers if you walk in with some crazy iphone thing uh that says you're from movie pass we don't have to honor it 
That's not part of the deal. So AMC backed away, Camera Cinemas backed away, Landmark Theaters backed away, and then, and then it's pretty much dead. So now Movie Pass has to go to the theaters and try to talk them back into doing Movie Pass, which if, if you didn't see last week's episode, was a, was a service that would allow you to pay a certain amount a month to see unlimited movies. Yeah, it's uh, it's a shame too because I think whether or not you think it's a good deal or a bad deal, I think the idea has tremendous merit, and it just sounds like uh, it sounds like they just went really poorly about communicating their intent to everyone. Because my guess is this really would have helped those movie theaters, but because they weren't asked, somebody got uppity and they decided to can the whole idea. So, do you think that's it? Do you think that this is a dead dead on arrival idea? I don't. I don't think it's entirely dead. I think they have a big, steep uphill battle here. Uh, I don't know what they're... I'd put their chances at around 17%. If, if, if <laughs> 172 If I had to handicap them. But yeah, I... I if, if they had gotten the theaters in on it at the beginning, maybe. Or maybe their gamble was, we want to get people excited about this in the public so that we can then convince the theaters because otherwise they'll just say flat out no. So maybe the, maybe their chances have increased. But it seems to me the theaters seem pretty miffed about this. So they're, it's going to take a lot of talking to get them back on their side. And it's not impossible. Yep, I agree. And it's a bummer because it's a novel idea. And, I'm, and if nothing else, I would have loved to see how the experiment went down. But uh, it looks like we'll never really have the chance for it. All right. But, uh, I, I will say that a couple of the letters we got uh, mentioned that um, uh, ticket prices in, uh, I think it was Kansas City, Missouri, were uh, like $6 on a regular night, uh, $10 on the weekend. And the guy said that he wouldn't go for it unless it was only $30. So I, I was about to say $30 because $50 in San Francisco seemed like it was just over four movies worth per month like maybe right. five or six movies worth and so if, you, if your tickets are around six dollars i was going to say then probably 30 bucks would work so i think you're gonna they would have to price it at around five to six movies worth a month to make people right. psychologically go well I, I can do that i can see two movies every couple weeks in a movie every week right totally agreed totally agreed all right uh, we hardly knew ye movie pass beta the once and future movie pass beta we came not to praise Movie Pass Beta, but to bury her. Yeah, and she will rise again, perhaps someday. I believe. <laughs> wait, wait, was that a line for? No, something? I just, that was, I'm writing my own script now. <laughs> uh, which is you not the Hamlet soliloquy. Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, if if like me though, you you run out of movie quotes. There's a cure for that. It's our sponsor, Netflix, at netflix.com slash twit, where you can get a 30-day free trial of their streaming service, watch all kinds of Shakespearean movies and Arthurian movies, and just have your head filled with quotes. Uh, you know what, best part? Reads your mind. Literally reads your mind and knows how much you're going to like a movie before you even try it. It's been scientifically proven, plus also built in 30 days of free babysitting. Because I had to get stuff done in my office... And I only had to go out like once every 90 minutes to set up business for my three-year-old. That's probably not the best way to raise your kid. But I'm like, I want her to learn that you will grow old and die. So I try to cue up a movie like Up or... No Country for Old Men. There you go. There you go. Oh, wait. That's probably not one you want to play. <laughs> Learn about gangsters doing gangster stuff. So I go and I load up Pulp Fiction. And, and of course, <laughs> right now, see it right on there, The Iron Giant, one of my all-time favorite movies. Uh, in fact, actually, I meant to bring this up beforehand, but I forgot. I'm glad I saw this. Brad Bird directed The Iron Giant. You definitely need to check it out. It's free right now on instant streaming. And uh, Brad Bird directing the new Mission Impossible movie. Have you seen the trailer for it? I have not seen the trailer for the new Mission Impossible movie yet. So good. So good. In fact, we should do that in Film Film. I, I, I now hereby proclaim it. Okay. Put the link in. Uh, <laughs> meanwhile, you probably have Netflix, people. You probably have Netflix. If you're, if you're going to get Netflix, you might already have it, right? But you probably know somebody who could benefit from this 30-day free trial. So do a neighbor or a friend a solid. Tell them about Netflix.com slash twit. Tell them you can stream movies to your Mac, PC, or iPad. If they say, you know, I don't want to do it on my Mac, PC, or iPad, tell them you can watch it on your iPhone and some Android phones, too. If they say, I don't want to watch it on my phone, say, you know what? If you got a game console, Xbox 360, PS3, or Nintendo Wii, you can watch Netflix right on your TV. If they're like, I'm not a gamer, say, well, then you can get Netflix on your TV with an Apple TV or Roku. They will not have an answer for you that you cannot meet with an Objection and get them to try out netflix.com slash twit for 30 days free. And we thank them for their support of Framerate. 
On game now. set match. Two. You just convinced all of America just then, dude. That's awesome. On to, I, all my work here is done. On to film film. Monty Python is gonna have a new movie. Sort of. Uh, wait a minute. I thought they disbanded a while ago. Well, they did. And one of their members, Graham Chapman, is dead. But they can still have him in the movie. Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are they really going to do that? Are they going to... How can he be in the movie? The surviving members of Monty Python's Flying Circus have reunited to voice an animated adaptation of Graham Chapman's weird memoir, A Liar's Autobiography. And the film will include recordings of Chapman reading from the book. Oh my gosh, that's not in some kind of fake, like, weird, out-of-context quotes from some old footage we had laying around. This well, was, Glenn, I would like... Yeah, it's not <laughs> yeah, like exactly, that. Exactly, right? <laughs> this is the author's own words, the way he meant them to be spoken for a project that they're meant for. You, you don't normally hear this. Normally when you hear this kind of story, it's always like, what do you read, Jiggered? Some, you know, random DNA we found on the floor, and it's pretty much the <laughs> We actor. created a clone. No, yeah, it's, 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 give yeah. or take. it's not that at all. In fact, this is brilliant. And, and I would expect nothing less from the Pythons, who frankly have have not been averse to doing continued Python stuff, but they're always very careful to not do it in an obvious or cheap manner. Yes, and, and I hope that, that this is a continuation of that. I remember seeing a couple of them showing up doing the, the, the dead parrot sketch just flat out on Saturday Night Live with one kind of wink and nod to the fact that they're just, with no pretense or excuses, they're like, yeah, that's what we're doing. We're just redoing that skit from 20 years ago. Yeah, exactly. What do you, you got to say to that? You want to fight about it? It's brilliant. Also, Adam West has been seen in an area of England where they are filming The Dark Knight Rises. Is Adam West going to be in The Dark Knight Rises, Brian? Uh, yes, and he should be. And if they don't, then they're just jerk faces that refuse to allow my childhood to live again. But th number number one, like who kind of, I don't know, all these little cameos, they never really do anything for me. I guess I guess it's kind of fun to try to find Stan Lee in that wheel, Where's Waldo kind of experience. But it's like, does it make it a better movie experience for you when you see those? Uh, I like it when they're done very subtly, like the Stan Lee cameos i think are always done with a wink and a nod but if you don't know who stan lee is you don't notice they're there yes they're, correct. They're, you know Take so it, away. it's the right way to do it which is those of us who know stan lee go ah, there he is that's awesome but but it's not so like forced and you know where somebody's like well that was weird what was that about uh, uh, so if 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 this were to be true which frankly it's not i mean all it is is at, they saw adam west somewhere in england england's a big place uh, <laughs> Just because he happens to be no, somewhere not. near Everybody The Dark Knight Rises does not mean he's going to be in The Dark Knight Rises. Everybody knows that England is smaller than Rhode Island, and you can't fit more than 12 people in all of England. And not, it, well, Adam was there, they were shooting a movie. England may be smaller than Rhode Island on the outside, but it's bigger on the inside. See, freaking TARDIS. TARDIS England. You're messing <laughs> Yeah, uh, the, I'll tell you what, as far as, as, far as like novel cameos go in general I, I honestly don't have an opinion one way or the other I think I like them I think I like them on balance when I catch them yeah I, I, I think I, I think I like them too so I I wouldn't mind a decently done Adam West but don't force it in there it would it'd be really nice though it'd be a nice tip off and I think they would probably do it right the, the Dark Knight franchise so if like, anybody were You'd be upset if the Dark Knight was there and like, uh, and he's driving by and he stops and there's a guy in the 1960s Batmobile with the with the old school costume on. He's like, I'm about to go to a kid's birthday party. Ha <laughs> ha! Not yeah. like that at all. No, okay. no, I don't think so. The first part of the movie, A Lonely Place for Dying, is available on Vodo while the filmmakers are getting ready for their theatrical run in early 2012. Now, here's the deal. They're releasing this on Vodo, which is a, a torrent application, and asking viewers to donate if they like what they see. If they raise enough cash from this, they'll be able to watch the film again on the big screen during the release. In return for their contributions, donors will receive digital downloads or credits in the upcoming release. You can even become an executive producer and get your name listed on IMDb. Um... I'm really? gonna say, yeah, okay. I'm gonna say this will not work, and not because it shouldn't work. It should work, but from a branding perspective, uh, if this was on Kickstarter, 
and you could download it even if it was over BitTorrent on Kickstarter. And if they have a Kickstarter, that'll be where their money comes from, where it's just like click here to grab it. And somebody who goes to Kickstarter and clicks on a link, let me watch the movie, they don't understand or care if it's coming over BitTorrent or from a dedicated server or whatever, but they're the type of people who go to Kickstarter. And the type of people who go to Kickstarter are people who like to trade money for the good feeling of having made an important uh, thing happen in somebody else's life. The type of people who go to Torrent Freak and who download movies on BitTorrent are not the type of people who like giving money for anything at all, ever. So, so I, I, again, I disagree. I, I don't think that, I think you're overstating the case, but go ahead. I, well, I'm just saying, I'm just saying that, that from a branding perspective, it's, a, it's novel and it's good, and there's certainly plenty of movies that show themselves for free and then generate money for a large-scale release. I'm just saying that's not the venue I would have gone to to release it to because it well, look, does matter that this is where it's coming out. The only way the, the reason I say I disagree is that I think, I, I think you're right that a, a lot of people who torrent – wouldn't spend the money to go see the movie. And I think the directors actually know that, which is how they're able to convince the theater owners to let them get away with this, to say, look, you're not going to be undermining the audience. But I think it's I think it's too far to say they'll never give money to anything. In fact, no, 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 I, think I, they, I think there is a chance that they'll give money to stuff. And I don't think they're... I think you might be right about Kickstarter, but I don't think they have to use Kickstarter because they're not saying the only way we can get this movie made is if the torrenters donate. I think it's, they're saying, look, we're going to put it out there, and instead of just putting it out there and saying, well, that'll give us some publicity, we're also going to solicit for donations. We're going to give you something back. We're going to give you a, an authorized download. We're going to help you to see the thing in the theater. We'll give you a credit in the movie. That's brilliant. That's something you can't buy otherwise. So it can encourage you to go, well, yeah, you know, actually, I really like this movie. I want to support these guys. I want to have an executive producer credit. I want to be on IMDb, you know? And, and so I, I think it's a way of additional funding. If you think about it as supplementary funding, rather than complete funding, then it makes sense to me. Uh, okay, well, here's, here's what I say. And understand, I mean, I'm, I'm using hyperbole, off, obviously, when I say nobody spends any money, whatever. That's not entirely true. I'm just saying you're on the street, and you need to go pitch your case for why somebody should donate money to make your movie dream come true. To your left is a biker bar filled with anarchists over at Torrent Freak, uh, and on, you know, in BitTorrent or whatever, to your right uh, is, um, you know, uh, some kind of hoity-toity NPR, for, you know, hippie-loving upscale bar. Uh, I know which one of those, historically, people have more success going to approach and try to make it happen. That's all I'm saying. I'm saying if the biker bar folks like what you do and respect it, they are much more likely to buy you a beer than the guys in the hippie bar. And that's all. They just want somebody to buy them a beer and help them get this movie made. Uh, you know what? I, I think you're almost right in that everybody at the biker bar, you will walk in and everybody will loudly cheer for you. They'll ask you to do your Pee Wee Herman dance while they play tequila. And then when it comes time to donate, they'll all be like, oh, man, I'm sorry. I'm using my parents' computer. I'm just on borrowed time. I don't have any money. I think it's awesome what you're doing, though, man. It's so well, You so may awesome. be right about the majority, but remember, this is a very large bar. And you only need a few rich bikers in there. <laughs> I would like to point out that in the chat room, I am winning over a few of them. Torrent Fiend says Brian understands he is one of us as a recovering torrentaholic. I'm just saying, I'm just saying the, the way I saw it back when I was a bad boy, before yeah. I became a bad right. boy. All right. Uh, moving on to Netflix coming to Latin America. Oh, thank goodness. Mexico, you know was... Central America, South America, and the Caribbean, 43 countries in total, uh, will be able to instantly watch a wide array of American local and global TV shows in a variety of languages, including Portuguese, Spanish, and English. Uh, that is awesome, because if there's one thing I am growing, I, I'm not going to say I'm annoyed. I'm not annoyed. I understand. It's frustrating for you guys who don't have Netflix or Hulu or whatever, but uh, I also have heard it quite a bit, and I'm glad to hear that there, there, there'll be that. If it were up to me, none of you would ever complain that 
Netflix is not available in your area or Hulu. And I hope that all this gets fixed as soon as possible. Uh, later this year, they haven't given exact dates for the different countries, oh. but they have announced the countries, so now they're committed to it. You just you just took the wind right out of my sails. The fact that it hasn't even happened, that is coming up in the future. Yeah, 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 but it will. I, I believe it. I'm, I'm not a doubter on this one. They, they would, Netflix is not going to come out. They're not going to risk coming out here and saying this and then 2012 and, or 2011 ends and they're like, I uh, still haven't come to Latin America, Reed Hastings. What's up with that? They just don't strike me as that kind of company yet. Maybe they will by yeah. the end of the year. I was about to I say. Doubt it. I doubt it. Netflix, Netflix usually that. keeps their word. They did the same thing with Canada. They said, we're coming to Canada, and then they came to Canada within a reasonable amount of time. I have no reason to disbelieve them. Now, we should watch the trailer for Mission Impossible. Oh, is there something? Oh, no. Am I? You are a robot right now, <laughs> and I can't understand robot oh, speak. I what? I don't. Am I back? You're back. Please sing back. Oh, my gosh. This is killing me. This is killing me. Time Warner, Austin, I'm telling you, I should never have upgraded to your new awesome service that in every way broke my reliable internet that I had for two years. For two years, I never once had an outage. I upgraded to your stupid Doxis 3, and it's nothing but tragedy as far as my eyes can wait, see. Wait, wait, wait. That should be saved for tube tops because Time Warner is a cable TV company. Actually... It should be interferon. Oh, I guess because, because it's web. Yeah, yeah, you're right. No, it should Inter be interferon. Okay, yeah. But you know what we should watch right now? The Mission is, Impossible trailer. Uh, Mission Impossible trailer. Specifically, uh, I don't know about you, but I have nothing but unending love for Brad Bird. I, I am not crazy about the Mission Impossible franchise. I am crazy uh, for anything Brad Bird has done. He was so screwed over by the way the Iron Giant was released. And when he came back and rocked it hardcore on The Incredibles, I could not have been happier. And now he's making the jump from animation to live action with this little gem that looks pretty badass. Let's take a look. An hour ago, a bomb blew up the Kremlin. The president has initiated ghost protocol. The entire IMF has been disavowed. Now I've been ordered to take you to Washington where they will hang the Kremlin bombing on you and your team. Unless you were to escape after assaulting Brandt and me. But if any one of your team is caught, they will be branded terrorists out to incite global nuclear war. So what happens now? Your mission, should you choose to accept it. So, what's the play? Red? Dead. You're not gonna make it! You're not helping. That looks like the Mission Impossible tradition of good director takes the franchise in a new direction that turns out to be awesome i'm waiting for the snark here because yes. i have nothing but optimism <laughs> the, i just don't still don't understand why they would pin the crime on the international monetary fund 
<laughs> I think it's a different IML. Oh, is it? Okay, all right. Yeah. yeah. That was the only. That was the only thing that was confusing me. I think too, because when I heard that, I'm like, I am like the International Monetary Fund. <laughs> Why would they be doing to blow up the? Uh, yeah, I think I I saw the first one in the movie theaters. The other two I just caught on cable. But this is one, and again, it's just straight up nothing but adoration for Brad Bird. That'll that'll definitely get me in the theater. It looks very it. promising. I mean, if you like this kind of movie, for those the folks out there that don't like explosion action movies of any kind you're not going to like this one but no, there's but, there's this and, the, and then and there's and there's there's cheaper versions of them which we'll probably talk about shortly but you know <laughs> this looks like a really well done action adventure movie but i'll tell you one thing i've seen for brad bird is that he is completely immune to cheese he, he there, there's no cheesiness he in is all. lactose intolerant that's what I'm saying. I'm saying he has the ability to to uh, convey to do big action scenes, but not make them silly. Or if there's a little silly wink, it's something that that it doesn't take you out of the moment. The way, for example, I don't know, a Michael Bay handles things with uh, Transformers Three. Spe- By the way, unrelatedly, have you watched any movies recently? Uh, well, I was going to check in on the movie draft first before I uh, revealed that. Well, let's do that. Then. Uh, but I, I have. I, I watched Gidget Goes to Rome. Let's check in on the movie draft. Yeah, maybe we better. Ah, Justin Robert Young still sitting in the catbird seat for continuing two, his domination over the masses for two more I'm weeks. He'll that be able to go for a thousand years. Is the year or two weeks until Harry Potter comes out. Uh, but what are you talking about Transformers: Dark of the Moon, Cargill's big bet, hundred eighty-one million uh, after the first weekend, uh, still has him in fifth place. Yeah, well, he's got a lot. It should be put. Well, actually, I was going to say that this was his first movie, but I totally forgot about the Green Lantern. He, yes. Green Lantern underperformed for him, I think. Uh, he should be at the, least in the middle of the pack after those two. Uh, so uh, he's yeah. lagging a little bit behind. Uh, I, I was out. actually not disappointed by Larry Crown, to be honest. At did, 15, did you go see it? What did it make? I, did, I didn't see it, but 15742000 you know, seems like nothing, but it outperformed prom. Uh, it's, it's it's very close uh, to your highness. So here's the question. The question is, which one of us made the bigger blunder? You paying $15 for Larry Crown or me paying $15 for your highness? Yeah. Now, your highness only ended up making $21 million. I think Larry Crown might pass your highness, but I don't think it'll get too much farther than that if it does. <laughs> uh, so I think we're, we're going to end up pretty close on that one. Uh, at this moment, I believe I own the uh, the. Oh, I'm sorry. No, Justin has the worst performer with prom. He only mm-hmm. made 1.2 million per right. dollar spent, and that's unfair but, because that's one he didn't actually buy. The right. movie he bought got rescheduled, so he he was awarded that. Correct. I, I, and I had the same thing happen last year with Kick Ass as well. But Zookeeper uh, is your movie this weekend. It's kind of an off week for movies. Uh, it's it's a kind of a comedy, child friendly film. How are you feeling? Uh, you know what? I'm surprisingly feeling pretty good about it, given the fact that I keep seeing... Have you seen these zookeeper loops on YouTube? I'm going to post them in the chat room so you can see this. No, I, I think it's tube.com uh, slash zookeeper loops. And they're just they're stupid things somebody's grabbing from the trailer that just loop over and over and over again. And they're trying to make them into, <laughs> into viral weirdnesses. And, uh, I, and I guess TGI they're floating around Fridays, enough because I just TGI got this Fridays, random... TGI Fridays, TGI Fridays. Okay, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> That's all it is. It's just hypnotic weird loops. And I and somebody said uh, he wrote me like I swear if this movie makes 150 million dollars and wins you the draft, you and I are done. Like like wow. It's just seriously annoyed that there's a chance Zookeeper can make some big bucks. But you know uh, you know Paul Blart made a ton of money and um, uh, Grown Ups made a ton. Of, oh crap, uh, Grown Ups made a ton of money as well. I accidentally turned off my own stream there trying to turn that off. Um, but uh, I'm gonna be happy. I'm optimistically hoping this thing makes a hundred million. I just want to be clearly number two, not barely number two. You think I know- Zookeeper can make a hundred million? Yeah, I do. I do. Uh, you mean overall, like not in the first weekend, but no, of course, yeah, no, no. Yeah, first yeah, weekend, yeah. I think you're looking it, it at might, it might, no. oh, it might overall. All right, uh, let's. Uh, as I said, uh, the only movie I watched this week was on Independence Day morning. Uh, we turned on Sony Pictures Classics, and it was Gidget Goes to Rome. And we were actually kind of fascinated with the whole Mad Men looking aspect of it because it was shot in 1963. Uh, so, so, like, a- ironically, 19- even when we got bored, we kept watching. We were both like, "Yeah, this was getting boring. Ah, this isn't very interesting anymore," and we just left it on. So, 
just one of those. I didn't see any actual movies that I meant to see. How about yourself? Uh, you know what? I went after we did, um, you know, we did this, the massive, we did, I did This Week in Tech, and then afterwards we did the video game show. And then later on, I met up with Brett Rounceville and uh, his girlfriend, Katie Mo, and we went and saw uh, Transformers 3 because I'd heard it was the best of the three, and I heard it was, um, uh, you know, worth seeing in 3D. And uh, man, was that movie, there was like three brief islands of clever inside an endless sea of suck it was like there was people there were people laughing at the opening of it because it was so cheesy and over the top and they're so and again you know the response to this is oh i'm sorry did you go to a michael bay movie and not expect over the top dialogue and that kind of thing and i understand all that right but it's like i just wanted it to be slightly less cheesy i guess i don't know it's all the characters are unlikable that nothing makes sense it's a mishmash of random images for absolutely no reason whatsoever um but i will i am going to go ahead and and spoil to save everyone money i'm going to say i'm going to spoil like the two moments i thought were really clever can we take us to some kind of spoiler alert okay Yellow, red. My name name is a spoiler. (laughs) Spoiler alert, Brian. (laughs) Spoiler alert, Brian. Uh, As as you uh, may or may not know, the character uh, uh, Sentinel Prime is played by uh, uh, Leonard Nimoy, and uh, there's a couple of nice little winks in there. Uh, Separately, the character. uh, Bumblebee speaks only in quotes from old movies and stuff because I guess on his magic radio they play old movies all the time. But at some point, like he goes to say goodbye to to, to Sam and it says, uh, you know, I will always be, and it's a chop of all these different movie quotes. But the last one is your friend. And if you listen closely, it's very clear that the your friend at the end is from Leonard Nimoy in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan saying, I am and always will be your friend. Uh, and then likewise, there's another nod to it when, um, now this is spoiler alert, Red, because I'm going to ruin the plot of the movie right now. So there uh, was one the, to ruin. That's uh, good so, to Yeah, exactly. Sentinel Prime uh, turns out to, after the, you spend half the movie protecting him because he's an important good guy, turns out he's totally a bad guy, right? And then uh, he wants to enslave the human race and take back all, you know, and rebuild Cybertron around Earth. And, uh, and he, he actually says at some point, he's just like, foolish, you know, foolish Autobots, when will you learn that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few? Ah. Which I thought was another fantastic Those are novel. both cool. And that's, those are the only two reasons to watch it. Those are, okay, yeah. So do you feel that you ought to warn people away from this movie? I would say, even though... Because of all the hype saying, oh, this is the best of the three. Do you feel like you oh, need to come back? I actually do. Yeah. I actually do. I would say, I right. would say don't, don't believe the hype. This movie is, is, I had a worse time during this one than I did during the first one. So you need and to I start, to like. you need to start, don't believe the Transformers 3 hype.squarespace.com. Oh my God, I so should. Then that way I could bring my message to the masses. And you know what's great is it would look good. It would look professionally designed, even though I don't know a thing about HTML. I would have all these templates to choose from, and when it becomes massively popular, because it's on Squarespace, it's got distributed hosting, so it won't be brought down by Reddit or Dig or Twitter or Twitter, any of those guys. No matter what, people will know not to believe the hype around Transformers 3. I I should point out that Squarespace is a sponsor of Tech News Day. We should disclose that. Uh, oh, are they? <laughs> yeah, Squarespace.com uh, oh, helps to bring you frame rate. And, and because of that, uh, if you think that sounds pretty awesome and you'd like to start a Transformers 3 warning site or any any kind of site, frankly, go to Squarespace.com, sign up for a free account. You don't have to give them your credit card number. Just try it out. Start building your website. And if you decide to keep it and purchase the service, use the offer code FRAMERATE7 and get 10% off for six months. That's squarespace.com, offer code FRAMERATE7. Build a website for yourself or others that will stand the test of time and reliability and look awesome. And we thank them for their support. Squarespace.com, use that offer code. Pass it around. FRAMERATE7. It's a whole new month. Got to use it. Yeah, even two. if somebody doesn't like our show, even if somebody's like, you know, you know what I've never heard of is a show called Frame Rate. You're like, well... You can still use the code. Just they don't have to like the show. Like the they show. can still That's get right. the discount. All right. They don't even have to watch Tube Tops or anything. All right. Uh, no, no Tube Tops news this week, really. Uh, but 
I have finished watching season one of Breaking Bad. Okay. Oh. And first of all, let me point out, you were very sly with the way you let that drop. Like just yesterday, you're like, oh, BT Dubs, guess who just finished the whole first season? How's that fringe coming, Brushwood? And I'm like, Dude! <laughs> That was wrong of me. But what happened was I really was set on us starting Fringe and Breaking Bad in the great Breaking Bad Fringe experiment together. Uh, but Eileen bought me season one on Amazon Video for a uh, present. And so we watched it on the Roku. That'll do and, it. And Independence Day, nothing much going on. A little grilling, a little swimming, and then just watching. All, it's only seven episodes long. Yeah. So it's just okay. like chomp, chomp, chomp. Ate them all up. Nope. Before we talk about my, my side of the equation, talk me through your experience. Were you hooked like the moment you saw it or you're just like, oh, I guess I'll keep plowing through this? Because for me, it's like there are two television series that instantly got me from episode one. One is The Shield and the other is Breaking Bad. And they both needle me in that sweet spot that, that I love watching characters in agonizing situations. Well, Did it's, you it's, a, it's a pipe, not a needle. But yeah, I get what you're saying. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, was, I was sucked in from the beginning. Uh, the 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 main character Walt is so well done. It's tragically funny. It's darkly funny. There's there's parts that are you're like this isn't really supposed to be funny, but it's kind of supposed to be funny. Uh, right. And and so that I love that. I also love one thing I noticed is they let stuff happen that nobody usually lets happen in TV shows. Little things like they're sitting, you know, having the intervention with Walt or whatever. Uh, they're sitting around talking to him, and the Afghan just kind of flops down at one point when Walt Jr. makes a gesture. They don't go back and reshoot that. They don't fix it. They just let it flop because you know what? That happens. And it's, it's a warts and all kind of show. There's and lots of little things like that that you can tell. Like somebody drops something at one point, and you can tell, like, well, that should have been reshot. It wasn't they're supposed to drop, but they just they just kept it. They're like, yeah, that's that that stuff happens. That's real life, and I liked that. It really added uh, something to the whole reality of what is otherwise a kind of hard to believe situation that they're trying to sell you on. But it's so it's so interesting that I'm totally sold. Uh, you're absolutely correct. It is the kind of show that could be done over the top in a way where you just lose all credibility. It's it takes you out of it. But instead, they're able to take. It's this slow build, and it's like, you know what? Maybe it was, in a, it was unlikely that we got to here. But here's where we are now. So what do you do to handle it? And so and so, you know, I think on balance is very believable the directions that the characters take. I I, I think there's one kind of MacGyver moment in the first season is there is there a standoff where they're arguing and about a negotiation and there's a, a tr some trickery happening is that in the first season or well second? there's a there's a standoff where he uses his chemical knowledge to gain yes. leverage is that what you're talking about yeah yeah, well, uh, yeah uh, no no oh I'm sorry uh, we're talking about in the second episode is the one you're talking about no I'm talking about like the seventh episode okay yeah yeah when 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 there's a sales negotiation yes and there's exactly some, ha, and yeah. And, and what I like, too, is all of the stuff, they are masters of the tease ahead, the very subtle tease ahead. So that yes. situation that you're talking about, at the beginning of the show, and this could be a spoiler if you really know chemistry, but I doubt it. It's going to spoil you know what? Uh, first of, of all, we're dancing all around. We're at least at spoiler alert yellow. Let's put Come a spoiler on. alert yellow. Because at the beginning of that episode, spoiler alert. he talks about mercury fulminate in the classroom. And... It doesn't tie into anything else until the very end of the episode when you're like, even before he says anything, you're like, that's Mercury Fulminate because he explained about all this at the beginning. And that's, yeah. all, that's the only thing that, you know, so it's 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 pretty friend. It's pretty, pretty fantastic the way they do that or and, and they do something that so many shows try to do and it almost becomes cheesy and they do it in a, such a not cheesy way, which was start the show with the end of the show. Yes. And then go three weeks earlier or 12 hours earlier. Right. They do it so well that I can't see where it's going. No. Where usually it becomes really obvious really quickly how you're going to get to that final, final scene. Right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'll tell you, they keep on rocking uh, specifically in future seasons. And I, and I don't think this is a spoiler for you, Tom. Uh, 
it, it probably will not surprise you that there are different aspects of the story that become more important and it goes in different directions. Characters, other characters undergo transformations as well. How about that? Yeah. Uh, and so, so as I, result, okay, fine. I get it. There are werewolves next season. Yeah, okay. you, you find yourself, you find yourself experiencing with the same cast and characters a completely different drama as other characters are placed outside of their comfort zone. Well, and that's what The Wire is so brilliant at. Yes, I mean, uh, intentionally going to an entirely different show almost every season, but with a lot of the familiar characters in different situations. So I, I, Absolutely. I'm looking forward to starting season two. I also did finally get around to watching the pilot of Falling Skies, the Spielberg show on TNT. It was not as bad as everyone had warned me it was. I, I, I found it to be sufficient. I might watch the second episode. It didn't blow me away, but I I thought it was a decent story. Uh, it's certainly you know set against Breaking Bad doesn't compare at all. But I, I'm willing to I'm willing to follow this this post apocalyptic story a little longer and see what happens. Uh, yeah, and uh, as a matter of fact, we that was another thing we got a lot of letters on. And since I hadn't seen it, and I didn't know if you hadn't seen it, we, we had put it in there. Uh, I am finally catching up. I'm making good on my obligation to watch The Wire since somebody decided to dive in face first. You're watching The Wire? I'm sorry, I said The Wire. I meant Fringe. Oh, the reason, okay. <laughs> the reason I said the reason I said I'm the rewatching wire. The Wire. So screw you, Tom. No, the reason the reason I said the wire was because I was distracted trying to figure out this comment in the chat room where Beef said I was trying to figure out what this means, the wire arrow star, and then I realized it says the wire is greater than, than and he put an asterisk yes. as a wild card. Right. Like the wire is greater than everything. So that's why I accidentally said the wire. Sorry about that. So how far into fringe? What episodes have you watched? How, what's your approach? Uh, I watched the entire pilot last night, and I got to tell you, I'm sort of at a dilemma now because you gave me the prescription of suggesting that I just watch the first and last episode of the first season and then start watching the rest from there. But I enjoyed the first episode okay. enough that I kind of want to plow through. You but should. Uh, then here's I would I would adapt my prescription uh, okay. based on the patient's reaction and say you should go ahead and watch episode two and keep watching the episodes until you get to a point where you're not feeling it anymore. To where I feel like they're homework. And as yeah, soon as, 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 soon as that homework, happens, skip to the final the episode of season one and go from there. Uh, it may never happen. May, maybe you'll dig the Monster of the Week situation enough that, that it'll pull you through. I did watch every episode. I just hit a lag at one point where I, you know, I kind of had to push through a few of them to get through season one. Although I heard some disturbing reports that, uh, that kind of concerned me. Uh, somebody tweeted me saying that the first episode of Fringe cost $1.4 million and was shot in Toronto and everything else was shot much cheaper in New York. And that made me wonder if like, wow, is it all going to get like way it'll less be, awesome? It'll be interesting to see. I mean, the plots become very monster of the week as i just said yeah. which is a lot cheaper to shoot but if you like the stories that's not going to matter as much you will get some some pretty nifty looking stuff at the end of the season and at the beginning of the second all right well that'll be interesting to uh to check out oh uh, as a matter of fact dizzle in the chat room has just hit me up saying there's an io9 guide to getting into fringe so maybe i'll check that, that out that's where i pulled my recommendation from and they actually identify a few other essential season one episodes that that are kind of the midpoint you know I, I, that are that are sort of midway between my rather severe treatment regimen of only the first and last episode they they acknowledge a couple more in there that that are building blocks for later seasons that you could take as an interim step and I'm being corrected as we speak right now. Somebody superseded the chat room and sent me a tweet right now saying that it was shot entirely in Vancouver. So maybe uh, maybe I was completely wrong with uh, the the information I was given at first. Yeah, was I love the, the way they shot it in Montreal. It was? No, I don't, I'm just... <laughs> Everybody knows Canada only has one city, and they just give it eight names. Canopolis and... <laughs> is the name of that city. Uh, any, anything else uh, that you want to add before we move on to Interferon? Uh, no, man. I'll tell you what. It's a slow time, but it, you know we do have uh, Breaking Bad coming up in just two weeks. Maybe one week. It's any minute now. Well, I've only got 24 more episodes to get through, so I, I may not make it in time for the premiere, but I should I should make it in time to catch up and be watching along with I'm gonna you. I'm going to tell you flat out, dude. Whether you try to resist, you will not be able to handle it, and I guarantee you, you're going to be caught up by the time this happens. I'm going to be a junkie. 
You are. You're right. going to be addicted. You're going to, you know, there's some chemicals that allow you to watch more shows in one 24 hour period because you won't need sleep so much. Yeah. If only there's a way to cheaply get those hid from a safe, reliable. Well, I, I, I get them. I get them on the corner near Revision 3, uh, Blue Bottle Cafe. Great coffee. On to Interferon. So we watched this whole thing before we recorded uh, Frame Rate, and the, the folks who watch live at live.twit.tv got to watch along with us. Uh, it's called Plot Device. It's a just under 10 minutes uh, short film that is up on Vimeo. Uh, an aspiring filmmaker adds a plot device to his Amazon shopping basket. He doesn't realize that he's just upended his life with a box that transports him from one action scene to another. And Cory Doctorow calls it great, funny, exciting short film and a clever way to advertise low-cost video effects package. Uh, Red Giant. Uh, Red Giant's own Aaron Rabinowitz uh, and Seth Worley uh, co-wrote the film, working together in collaboration. So they're trying to show off Magic Bullet Suite 11 from Red Giant uh, by running plot device which as i said it's it's you know he buys a plot device and it transports him from one action scene to another as the plot device changes brian what did you think uh i thought it was uh number one you gotta it it depends on how you grade it if you want to grade it as a short movie you know it ran a little bit long and uh and was rather simplistic in his plot but when you realize that essentially this is a stealth way for you to experience all of this is essentially a really kick-ass demo reel of of the product you're about to buy it almost reminds me of the uh the dancing baby thing from the mid-90s do you remember the dancing baby that everyone forwarded oh could i not all that was that that was essentially a demo for character studio from autodesk the makers of 3d studio max and as somebody who was into 3d modeling and animation at the time it drove me nuts i'm like why is everybody so crazy for this dancing baby when it's just a there it is when it's just demoing character studio and um you know what uh if this is the next dancing baby that's fine with me i don't think it'll take off quite that way but i do know that i absolutely loved um uh, when i watched the beginning of it i i, I and i don't know exactly what the rap Advertising. It's a suite of, of effects. Uh, I guess, magic bullets of, of effects. But I noticed when they set it up, they have him. Uh, he's already bought the, the DV Rebels Guide to movie making, right? And I don't know if that's from the same company or not, but I do know that I loved the DV Rebels Guide to movie making. That's phenomenal. Yeah, and I, I think it, looking at it just as a film and not as an advertisement, I think it's fun. I, I think it holds up. It plays with the genres. Some of the writing's a little weaker than, than maybe I'd want. I, I'm sitting there, you know, editing it in my head like, oh, no, the right thing to say there would have been this. But I, I'd say most of the movie, they get it dead right, and, and it's a fun play with the different tropes of movie making. Watching the chat room react to it when we played it before the show, it was interesting to see the people who were like, this is fantastic. I love every minute of it because they were getting the references a lot of other people were like this is stupid why is this you know i don't get it and i think those are people who weren't in the mindset of we're playing with the movie cliches and going from one to the other they were just looking at it as trying to tell a story and it doesn't tell a story at all no, yeah, the story is please buy our suite of awesome effects that allow you to create these scenes that we're portraying for you but I think, it, I think it looks good. I think the acting is good. Maybe the writing needs some help in places, but mostly the writing's solid. Uh, and, and remember, I, you know, so this is the other thing. A lot of people are like, okay, it's too long. I'm like, it's not a YouTube three-minute viral. It's, it's a short film. It's, right. it's a short. It's meant to yeah. be a short. And as a short, it works. But and it's funny it like how the context of stuff really changes our expectations to the point of like, oh, I'm watching it on the web. Then it needs to be two minutes with a hook and a better catch me quick. Uh, keep in mind also that the type of people who would buy this product are the type of people who will give enough time to sit through a 10-minute short movie because they're t the type of people who love telling stories and they want to see how other people tell them as well. So I, I think it's very, very clever marketing on their, on their part. Now we have some feedback to get to before feedback. How does, how does this work into Interferon? Uh, well, I was going through the feedback, and I actually saw somebody brought this story up to us, so I thought I'd give proper credit to it. Uh, basically, this comes from Stephen Lauren, who says, uh, First of all, this insane $20,000 set-top box with plan by Prima Cinema that astonishingly makes more sense the more you look into it. And he gives the link, primacinema.com. Uh, and he mentions that he got it from this BBC article here, and I actually drew it up 
uh, right here. We could take a look at some of this right here. Uh, essentially, the um, the BBC piece, and, and to be honest, if, if if you can, just jump straight to like two-thirds of the way through it. Uh, the whole first half of it talks about, uh, you know, talks about Hulu and Netflix and about how the the gap. There you go. Back it up just a little bit here, and let's take a listen to this guy describe the the service. Oh, yeah, we talked about this when I was still on Buzz Out Loud. I think the twenty oh, you really? pay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you pay twenty thousand dollars, and then you get movies same day. And yeah, I had never seen this before, so so I didn't. I thought it would be a good thing for us to discuss here, right in the interferon segment, to talk about the difference of uh, how we perceive web based video now. Engineer turned entrepreneur Jason Pang. Twenty thousand bucks too for a far probably. Every you know, anyone, but, but the, the, at least those the theory here is like cash. you know you've got money, you want to have a home theater in your basement, and these days everybody can have a home theater in their basement. It's not it's not a big rich person's deal anymore. So to make it cooler. You pay $20,000 for the set-top box instead of for all the other equipment that actually plays the movie. And instead of running your DVDs in it, you get special access to movies the same day they come out in the theater. Right. And it's $500 per movie. So you pay $20,000 for the set-top box, then you pay $500 to rent the movie. You get it in, like, they call it super high def, but it's t I think it's 1080p. Uh, and, 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 and you actually are... It might be enhanced, I don't know. But you are getting them same day. You're paying essentially the rate that a theater would have to pay if they expected a low number of tickets for uh, the movie. And I, mean, I think is this is very smart for the the for the, the distribution companies to say, look, we're not taking away a lot of people at $20,000 a set-top box. We're just making a lot more money off the movies. And specifically what they say is they say, we're not taking anyone away from the theater, and the people we are taking away are the type who would not be going and grabbing a bucket of popcorn and sitting there in a crowded theater with a bunch exactly, of other people. Exactly, exactly. These type of people who would, you know, pay 400 bucks under the table to some manager at a theater to get a 1 a.m. private screening or something like that. Let's move on to feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. This person doesn't have a name. Or they if they do, it's not here. But they uh, say, hey, guys, my wife and I took our kids to see Cars 2 this weekend. My four-year-old son loved it, but my three-year-old twin daughters were frightened enough to have to go out in the hall for about a half hour, so my wife missed some of the movie. Too many explosions and crashes, I guess, for them. I wanted to give you a heads up on a new Pixar movie coming out next summer. They showed a trailer for Brave before Cars 2. I actually said, wow, out loud two or three times. The scenery in these CGI movies are getting so good, I'm just amazed. I looked it up on IMDb and it has an interesting cast Emma Thompson, Billy Connolly, Craig Ferguson, and Robbie Coltrane, among others, lending their voices to it. Anyway, it sounds and looks awesome. And we have a YouTube link to the trailer if it'll play. And that's Chuck Byers, as you said that in. Oh, thanks, Chuck. I just didn't have his name here. I apologize, Chuck. The ancients spoke of it. It is the heart of this fierce land. It is carried in the wind. Pixar has a thing for Scottish accents these days. Born of our legends. And when we are put to the test, it is the one thing we must always be. So I'm surprised to hear you say Pixar has a thing for Scottish accents because all I could think of is uh, How to Train Your Dragon had like vaguely Scottish sounding accents, and uh, and I guess uh, uh, Mike Myers went back and reshot all of his lines for Shrek to give him a, a Scottish a Scottish accent. Who's Scottish in uh, in Pixar movies? How, how to Train Your Dragon. That's not a Pixar movie. That's a DreamWorks movie. Did you confuse DreamWorks for Pixar? That's why I said these cartoon companies, DreamSar, you pick, just PixWorks. The, the two of those, you just admit it. Admit it. Hey, we got another email here. 
No, I actually... I, I totally I, did. I, I forgot that How to Train Your Dragon was DreamWorks. Uh, which, which, by the way, I do not... That is in no way meant to disparage Pixar. I think DreamWorks is is freaking hitting their stride, and I think they're just a Pixar that doesn't insist you have to cry every movie. Uh, but the... Um, Specifically, uh, I brought this up because of the Cars 2 reference, and we were talking over the weekend about how upset people were about the graphic uh, torture and killing of cars, which I thought was a weird thing. So uh, I guess we had talked about, like, Molly Wood was, like, seriously been out of shape about it, and I didn't know if it was just Molly Wood, and then all of a sudden I get a tweet from my Bonnie, uh, my, my Bonnie, my wife Bonnie, my Bonnie lies who is lying the over the ocean. ocean, she's lying over the sea, and then she's tweeting about people slaughtering main characters in the G-rated movie that she took her kids to. So I'm surprised that I haven't heard from other people a bigger, bigger uh, blowback on, on how I don't know, visually graphic Cars 2 appeared to be. Yeah, and, and uh, so we got it. It sounded like this guy was like, yeah, it's totally fine. Two kids. Anyway, that's not why I wrote in. You know, it's just, it, <laughs> it's, it's, kind of a, uh, it's kind of a thing uh, that I think probably will reduce the Cars 2 revenue a tiny bit uh, for draft show purposes. But overall, folks seem to still have attended. They just won't recommend it to others. So here's here's a question I'm going to put to you. And and 10 years ago, Brian would be shocked to hear modern day Brian say this. But do you think one thing Pixar has done almost every release for the last six years or so has been pushed the boundaries of G rated appropriateness by either having very visceral, high energy combat uh, well or or you know making you cry every three minutes i mean going back to like the incredibles it was it was too much for my daughter when she was three years old because it was like it was a good action movie that happened you know and then you you find these people having a midlife crisis argument uh and essentially uh simulating a an affair with superheroism uh every year and then you got wally where it's like the whole world's gonna die and you know you're gonna ruin ruin the planet and the environment and the earth you know and so you have to rely on these quiet robots to fall in love and save everyone is that what you were going to say roughly what? you don't well you don't have to imitate a robot i, I get it you're talking about wally i froze again yeah oh, you're back. Oh. <laughs> so badly uh yes that's exactly what i was going to say and then and then you got toy story 3 where it's like guess what you grow old and you die and everything you love just becomes dust in the wind uh and, and up where they kill everyone in the first 20 minutes uh but <laughs> like at some point I, not spoiler alert because not true just yeah no that's wondering. not true but yeah. but the point is the point is like as beautiful as the stories are that they tell i'm sort of getting tired of them making every movie a test of what I feel okay about showing my kids. And I'm starting to move over to Team DreamWorks where it's like, you know what? I had a great time at Kung Fu Panda. I had a great time with How to Train Your Dragon. And I didn't cry once. Was there a question in there for me? I got distracted by the interruption. The question, the question is, are you getting Pixar fatigue where it's like you're just tired of, of – them doing things that are outside of what you would expect from no, a G-rated I am not. children's film. And, 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 and I think the reason I'm not is entirely based on the fact that I am not seeing these movies with children. Yeah. I, I think I, I am, when I go to see Pixar films, I go with my wife. And so to me, it's like, yeah, it's kind of dark, but really, it's not that, it's not that dark. I, I, I've, I saw Darker. I watched seven episodes of Breaking Bad, for goodness sake. This, you know, <laughs> Toy Story 3 being kind of sad doesn't really compare. Uh, so my perspective is based there. If I was taking my own children or others' children to these movies, then I would be seeing it through their eyes. And right. that would change how it hits me. And I think that's maybe why you're getting that fatigue of like, because you're constantly like running it through like, okay, how is, ooh, this would really affect a seven year old. You know what I mean? So I, I think it really has to do with that. And what Pixar was trying to do is that Sesame Street magic of let's have it appeal to the grownups and the kids. And what it seems to be doing is appealing to the grownups too much at the expense of the kids. And they need to find that balance again.
Yeah, I think so. I think this might be the first one that really kind of bites them in the ass, especially when, uh, for example, Wally. I know a lot of it was over the heads of the kids, and as a result, I mean, I don't know what the merchandising opportunities are for a, for a robot, you know, in a post-apocalyptic future, but we do know that the merchandising opportunities for cars were through the roof. It's the most prof profitable merchandising in all of Disney history. So I think that the cars too, like Wally being dark probably didn't affect merchandising at all because there was no expectation. But Cars 2 being too dark may adversely affect the marketing, op the merchandising opportunities, in which case I wonder if we'll see something different happen as a result. It could affect NASCAR coverage too. They may not want to show as many crashes. They may not want to show the graphic torturing and, and destruction of the cars. That they, after. that they usually do. That's right. No, that's, that's it uh, for this episode of Frame Rate, ladies and gentlemen. I would have liked to get to more of your emails, but we just ran out of time. Show at gmail.com is the email. And uh, we or a robot will read and respond to every one of your emails. You I, it's me. You and probably I'm, would rather have a robot do it. I'm so. the robot. I'm the robot. But could we buy a robot? Uh, we that. can construct a robot. We have the technology. Can we get Kuhan Kuh Kuh to build us a robot? A $6 robot. Or P. Delahanty. Anyway, we'll see you next time.